All right, here we go. I am recording on this computer again now. And uh, oh, there's Julie. Hello, Julie. Great, cool. Uh, there we go. All right. So hi, everybody. Thanks again for coming back to taste more wines with me this week to taste wines from the Loire Valley. Um, I just sent out uh, the handout about the Loire Valley and um, it's actually just the handout that I used. Oh, there's Krista. There you go. Um, so the handout that I sent out is actually just a handout. Oh, Krista, you were there five years ago when I did, or not five, two years ago when I did uh, my, I think my Loire seminar back in my old warehouse. So you might actually recognize this handout since I just took that handout and recycled it. Cause I checked, I was like, you know, I wonder whether I can use that handout from two years ago. And I checked and the Loire Valley is pretty much the same. Um, the Loire is in the same place that it was two years ago and the hills are still there and there's still a lot of clay and there's limestone underneath the clay and stuff like that. None of it's changed. What do you know? Great thing about wine. Um, so Loire Valley, <clears throat> uh, the Loire is one of the longest rivers in France. Um, wait, oh, the long river. Yeah, all, okay. It's one of the longest rivers in France. It's 650 miles long. So it's like talking about the Loire as a wine region is different from talking about like Burgundy or Bordeaux or the Jura or, you know, pretty much any other wine region in France um, because, or almost, almost anywhere. Like most other wine regions are more compact and like one uni like more uniform and cohesive in their culture and history. There are, you know, a whole bunch of similarities in the Loire, like across it, but, but it's the 650 mile long, I'm going to go to screen share here and, find uh, where pictures, 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 pictures. I find the maps that I just sent out. Um, here it is. Look, the map of the Loire is so big that it takes up two pages of the Jancis Robinson uh, wine atlas. So you have like, way up over here you have the share and you have Sancerre and stuff like that way up there and then you come all the way down the Loire you come through um Tour, Touraine, uh Anjou and uh all the way down to Muscadet and like the climate and the people and the soil are different like it's all different down there in Muscadet compared to up here in Sancerre. Um, so the Loire as a wine region is sort of a construct um, of, of us, of wine people to like group these things together and talk about them. But like, if you're talking about wines from the Loire Valley, like they're all very different and it, it's not super helpful to actually lump together Vouvray and, um, and like saint Porsan or something like that. Like they just don't have a whole lot in common really. Um, but anyway, today we're talking about red wines specifically from the Loire, not just everything from the Loire. So, um, so that like, that sort of, that sort of helps. Um, so Loire Valley, it's, uh, it's more Northern. It is to the East of Burgundy. So it's Northern France. It's, uh, it's cooler. It has colder winters. Um, frost is a bigger problem compared to, you know, the Rhone Valley and Provence and the Languedoc and Bordeaux and everywhere down there. Um, it's damper, uh, you have the river, you also have the Atlantic down at the end of it. Um, so there is more precipitation and also you have a lot of clay soil Then you know, clay, like clay holds water, clay holds moisture. And, um, so there's, it's a little bit more difficult to farm 
broadly speaking, in the Loire Valley than somewhere like the Languedoc or the you know the Southern Rhone, somewhere like that, where it's drier and warmer, and you know, it cuts down on the possibility of mildew and rot and you know things like that. Um, commonalities and other other commonalities along the Loire, uh, the Loire River itself is a commonality of the whole area. And that, that matters for um, the geography of, of it, like pretty much anywhere you want to talk about, whether you're talking about like um, Sancerre or whether you're talking about like Touraine or Anjou or Muscadet. Um, there's clay and limestone, uh, like clay up on the plateaus, of, like above the river, but you have all this alluvial, you know, soil and stuff, all this alluvial, I don't know what to call it, uh, like detritus that's come down with the river over the thousands, millions of years, you know, so you have like gravel, you have sand, you have a lot of other stuff all mixed in. And the Loire is this meandering river that's moved around a lot over the years. So it's left all these different deposits around it. So you have, you know, all, all these different diverse hillsides some of which face south, some of which face north, some east, west, you know. Um, and then you also have like this mix of soil types everywhere. You also have, um, there's a lot of limestone subsoil. You also have a fair amount of flint in a bunch of different places. Um, Kimmeridgean chalk, uh, flint silex. Um, <clears throat> so, you, so, it's, so it's kind of complicated soil-wise everywhere. Also, um, culture, the Loire is kind of cohesive culturally. Um, <clears throat> the Loire, when like talking about the French language, people regard the French that is spoken in the Loire Valley as being like the, some of the cleanest and most proper and most like French, French that is spoken in France. So if you like really want to learn like proper French, if you want to like, I don't know, be a lawyer or you want to be a like politician and speak in parliament or something like that, or going to like academia, like speaking French from the Loire Valley, Loire Valley French, like that is considered like very proper French. And I do, I don't know, I get this feeling, I get this impression from, from going and being there that like culturally people, the people in the Loire are very, um, st like sort of almost stereotypically French, like they're, uh, not like held back, but they're a little bit more like proper and traditional. And they're not quite as like, they're not as like warm and maybe extroverted as people down in like the long dock and Southern Rhone maybe sort of necessarily are, um, the Loire Valley is really like really, really sort of like a cultural heartland of France. Um, also historically, ah, got espresso all over myself. Um, historically, the wine regions of the Loire have benefited greatly from being on the river. Um, like the reason, part of the reason why Muscadet is famous and the reason that like Bourgogne and Chinon, Saint-Nicolas de Bourgogne, um, the reason that these appellations are famous and Sancerre um, and Vouvray, all of them, is that it was easy to, you know, export their wine down the river, you know, to the North Atlantic there and then bring it on boats up along the coast to, uh, what used to be the independent principality of Flanders up, you know, in like Northern France and uh, the low countries, the Netherlands um, and up to England and stuff like that. So it was really easy to export wine from the Loire Valley as opposed to like the Languedoc, um, which, you know, like the Languedoc's a pretty easy place to grow grapes and make wine. But 300 years ago, like, you had to drink all that wine yourself because you couldn't get it anywhere. You were just like stuck in rural landlocked Southern France. Whereas the Loire river, if you're a winemaker somewhere on the Loire, you can make wine, you can put it on like a, you know, a little, little river boat and like send it on down the river and get it to, 
people in London who have a lot of money to you know pay you for it. So um, so that is part of why the Loire has such a long winemaking tradition. I mean, they started making wine here. The Romans brought the Romans were here. The Romans brought winemaking um, grapes probably came up from um, Bordeaux and over from Burgundy. Uh, so wine's been made here for a really long time. But part of why the Loire is a winemaking powerhouse is just because the river allowed the wines to get out to other markets. Um, also, the Loire is kind of a hotbed of um, natural wine, organic wine, and natural winemaking. And I think it basically comes down to what Zev was saying last time about the Jura, that things like that sometimes happen in a sort of like atomic way where one guy starts working organically or naturally or biodynamically, whatever, and he's successful. And then his neighbors see, or his neighbors hear about it, you know, and they're like, Oh, well, yeah, he's doing it and it works for him, you know, like, okay, cool. I can do that. And then like their neighbors see that. And so it sort of spreads organically. And um, that definitely happened in the Loire. There were, you know, there were a bunch of, um, early, early wine make early, early, like natural winemakers in the Loire that got a lot of attention and that helped spread the ideas around the Loire Valley. Um, but okay, red wines, I'm going to shoot this espresso and then jump more into red wines. Um, the Loire, like, uh, it's a big place. So there are a lot of different grape varieties that are grown because different parts of the Loire are sort of climatically different. You know, Sancerre is cooler and a lot more um, continental. And then like Muscadet is very maritime. They're very like their weather patterns are very different. Um, so there are a lot of different grape varieties that are grown up and down the Loire. Um, there's, I don't have anything here today from the Northern, Northern Loire. I probably should have included Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir is more common. Like Pinot Noir is the red grape that is grown up in Sancerre. There's not a lot of it. Most of what is grown up there is Sauvignon Blanc because that's what the market wants and expects. Um, but there is Pinot Noir and there is more and more Pinot Noir as the climate has changed. Historically, the Loire, a lot of the Loire Valley had a hard time like fully properly ripening red grapes. Um, and so a lot of the Loire produced more white wine. That has changed as the climate has gotten warmer and people are growing more red grapes and making more red wine. So um, so I, I, it's like, it's getting easier to fully to like properly ripen red gra grapes. Also people are better at farming now than they used to be a hundred years ago. Um, and also the market is more interested in red wines. So we're seeing more and more red wines from the Loire Valley because of, because of all of those reasons. Um, I think sort of the heart of uh, serious red wine in the Loire is in um, Touraine. That's where Chinon and Bourgoy are. Uh, don't even know what I'm down down here. So you have like Tor the city of Touraine right there, and then you have uh, the village of Saumur, and then Angers there. So you get down into here, and like this is you have Chinon there, Bourgoy, Saint Nicolas de Bourgoy, and then Saumur over there. Um, and that's like I mean, those are those are <clears throat> that's where the the majority of red wine that's produced in the Loire or like red wine that we get here in America that's where that's where it comes from. Um, I'm just going to jump into wines now. So let's see. First up, uh, starting out with this, this is Domaine Chardon Gamay. Gamay, you know, so like I was saying, a lot of like grapes were, came over to the Loire from Burgundy and, uh, Gamay is a grape that was originally from Burgundy. They think Muscadet is also originally a Burgundian grape that's no longer like Gamay. Muscadet was outlawed. It was it was ejected. It was it was uh, thrown out, cast out of Burgundy, and um, found a home here in the Loire Valley. But so Gamay here from Domaine Chardon 
Um, this is Torain, but this is more upriver. This is not Chinon Bourgoy neighborhood. Um, I don't see a scale on here, so I can't tell exactly for sure. But I think um, Domaine Chardon here is from like Torain up this this away is up in this area. It's like 60 miles downriver from Sancerre, which is way over here behind uh, our faces. So this is from the sort of like northern or uh, upriver part of Torain. Um, so Gamay, Gamay has grown all up and down the Loire River because it, it ripens pretty well everywhere. Uh, this particular Gamay, I should go back to screen share, comes from vineyards that are up above the Loire, up above the Cher River. Where is it? Here we go. Uh, I went and visited them back in there. I'll put that down there back in 2012. Um, it's Sophie and Thierry. Uh, Thierry grew up, Thierry grew up making wine. He grew up with a winemaking family. Um, and his father had to sell the domain, uh, when he was younger and he ended up moving to Paris with his wife and, but then they decided to move back to the Loire to start a family and stuff like that. So they bought, I forget, 60 hectares. Maybe it's more than that. They have a, they have a lot of land uh, that they planted. The vines were like 20, 25 years old. Um, so it's up above the share. It's more like exposed sort of windy vineyards. Um, sort of like sandy clay with a lot of silex in it. That's a little piece of flint right there. You can see some more up here. Boy, I wish this is from so long ago before I really knew what I was doing. I wish I'd taken more, um, more pictures. Uh, these vines, you'll notice they're trained pretty low to the ground. The vines are relatively low. I mean, then the grapes are going to grow up there on those wire trellises. Uh, it's sort of like a like a sort of geo system. Um, but they're still, they're not that high up above the ground um, considering like for general Loire Valley, like in a lot of places, grapes are trained up higher because they want to keep them away from the ground because they're worried about mildew and moisture, you know, coming up from the, the wet soil. But um, I think because this is sort of on a ridge and it's windier and stuff, they weren't worried about that. And so they sort of trained the vines down a little bit lower. Um, this wine is, uh, made in stainless steel and then they age it in concrete tanks that are actually set down underneath the winery. So they're like concrete tanks that they just like built into the floor when they were having the winery made. It smells like Gamay. It smells like sort of perfumey and like a little bit like exuberant fruit. <clears throat> raspberry raspberry blackberry i've always liked this and i think this is really good classic loire gamay um it has that like fun playful fruit that Gamay that Gamay has like that you get from good Beaujolais but this has got more acidity it's like a little bit crunchier a little to me like a little bit more high to high toned and stuff like that compared to um to a lot of like Beaujolais like that is a little bit sunnier and like warmer and comes from more like a lot of Beaujolais a lot of the Beaujolais that we drink comes from granitic soil, which absorbs more solar heat and reflects it back at the vines and stuff like that. So when you're in the Loire Valley, um, I think the what the vines experience, the temperatures are a little bit cooler because it's more clay, because it's like colder, damper ground. So um, Loire Gamay to me is always like a little bit, a little bit leaner, a little bit just tastes like a little bit cooler but it still has really pretty fruit.
it's a great like summer sort of red wine like this i'm drinking this relatively chilled because it's in the warehouse here um and it's and it's perfect this way um I don't really know about their winemaking. I don't, I don't think this has like a lot of skin contact or anything. I think they're like, they're intentionally trying to make like a fun, bright red wine with this, you know, but it's like compared to, I would say that compared to like a lot of the Beaujolais we drank in that, that Beaujolais seminar, like this is also a little bit less tannic. It has less tannic structure compared to all of those. <laughs> red wine number two <laughs> it's a very modern label hurler berlou um this is sebastian david this is backwards there on the screen but you can sort of make it out uh this is a saint nicolas de Bourgogne. Uh, actually, so this is, I guess, the, so it's, it's all Cabernet Franc from Saint Nicolas de Bourgogne. It is not like AOC Saint Nicolas de Bourgogne. It's just a uh, Van de France, but, um, 20, 2019 is the current vintage of this. So this is, um, Cabernet Franc. But I'm going to go back to screen share here. It's Cabernet Franc, but Sebastian David makes this with um, carbonic fermentation. There, there he is. Um, I'm not sure what sort of a tank, whether he's using like stainless steel for this or fiberglass for the initial fermentation, but this is whole cluster, whole clusters. Um, doing like full carbonic, um, carbonic fermentation for 25 days. So, you know, no oxygen, the juice starts fermenting inside of the grapes. And then he does a gentle pressing of off of the juice after 25 days and holds the juice in concrete for six months, uh, before he bottles it. Um, he inherited 15 hectares. His family's been here since the 1600s, I want to say. He's 15th generation. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, I mean, that it's yeah, carbonic Cabernet Franc. What I like about this, it's carbonic, and so it's more express. It's like expressive and fun and juicy and bright. But it does still smell and taste like Cabernet Franc to me. Um, I recall from somewhere that I think he does a fair amount of like green harvesting and stuff like that. Like he works to keep the yields lower. So this, you know, this does still have some nice tan into it. Yeah, he's been, you know, like his family's been there. He's been around. He's a good winemaker. Like he knows what he's doing, but this is definitely a very modern expression of Cabernet Franc and of winemaking in the Loire. He is very firmly in the sort of like new school, you know, natural wine sort of camp. Yeah, nice balance. And there's like none, I guess the thing about it, there's none of the like pepper black pepper tannin and stuff like that that i personally really associate with cabernet franc but it's a fun wine and i you know that's also why i did it second because it's uh because it's a little bit lighter um this is so here's my my representative of uh of pinot donis although this is actually 50 percent pinot donis 50 percent grollo this is Sylvie Augereau. I think I'm pronouncing that right. 
It's just bottled as Vin de France. Uh, this comes from um, Anjou. So this is further down river. Anjou, uh, I don't actually really know why, but Anjou doesn't really produce a whole lot of red wine. Anjou is more known for white wines, uh, for a lot of uh, Chenin Blanc, for, you know, uh, Vouvray, for Sauvignier, for, uh, you know, White Sumor, um, Cotu de Leon is here in, uh, in Anjou. But Pinot Donis and um, Grillo are two traditional, like local red grape varieties that are slowly sort of making a resurgence. Um, Sylvie Augereau, I'll get over to pictures of her. Sylvie Augereau. Sylvie Augereau is is pretty interesting. I mean, aside from I love this wine, she's interesting because she's actually a journalist. Um, she went to school, studied journalism, and um, became like a food and wine writer, uh, wrote a bunch of books uh, about the natural wine movement. And then she started La Dive, La Dive. She started the like wine wine show, the natural wine show in the Loire in February called uh, called Le Dive. And you know, and still runs that today. And it's it's a really big uh, it's where everybody sort of comes together and gets together and like has a party and compares notes and stuff like that. It's turned into a pretty pretty big deal. Um that is here in Anjou. And so apparently like since she started that, there was this little tiny old vineyard that was like uh, one and a half acres somewhere right nearby that overlooks the Loire River that was, you know, full of old, old vines that she'd always sort of had her eye on. And then that vineyard came up for sale. Uh, oh, yeah, it's not even on Google Maps here. So the vineyard came up for sale one year and she snapped it up and started making wine. You know, I think because she's passionate about it and as, you know, so that to like to have firsthand experience of what she's been writing about for all of these years. So uh, the vineyard is actually like a, it's a field blend. It's co-planted. It's Pinot Donis, Grillo. Uh, I think there's some Cabernet Franc in it and there's definitely Chenin Blanc in it all mixed in together. Um so she she farms it herself. Everything is done by hand. Um, she believes really strongly in it's farmed biodynamically, and she believes really strongly in like interacting with the vines and talking to them and playing the music and stuff like that. So she hangs out with the vines and plays the music and stuff like that and has a good time in the vineyard. Um, and then she goes through. She makes like three or four different wines from it. She just harvests, you know, like vine by vine and harvests all the vines that she knows are, you know, Pinot Donis and Grolo. Uh, I think all together at the same time, it's not like two separate harvests because it's such a small vineyard. She's just doing like one harvest, all the Pinot Donis, all the Grolo, um, destemming it. And then it goes through a three, three week fermentation in fiberglass tank. So it's a pretty, pretty like normal standard fermentation. And then, uh, then it goes into used oak barrels and spends 12 months there. And this to me, like this is classic, like Pinot Donis aroma. Um, I think the Grolo gives it like, the Grolo gives it a little bit more fruit. Pinot Donis to me is usually a little bit lighter, but like the fruit that this has to me is Pinot Donis. It's almost like sweet tart sort of smelling to me. It's like tart, almost like strawberry fruit. And then it also has this like peppery, spicy, like aromatic herbal thing going on. Mm.
juicy and peppery. It has, I want to say it has like a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of volatile acidity on the palate that I just sort of like pick up in the finish that like makes my, like grabs my taste buds a little bit in a really, really nice way. Peppery, and it makes me think of like like white pepper, like pink peppercorns and stuff like that. It's a very classic, like this is very classic, like red Loire field blend, like fun, like sort of like day-to-day -day drinking, like farmer wine kind of, kind of a thing like this. It's very visceral. Um, I don't know how much she made of it. I want to say this is really small production. Um, it's made, you know, like it's made, she makes it sort of like as an experiment or like she makes it almost kind of sort of for fun. Okay, now I'm going on to Cabernet Franc. This is Bernard Baudry, Chinon, Le Domaine. So this wine is called Le Domaine. It's the wine of the domain. Um, Bernard Baudry makes a whole bunch of different wines from single terroirs. This is a blend of several different vintage site or vineyard sites. So this wine in particular, they're blending different terroirs to create like a really classic Chinon for them. What they, what they believe is a classic Chinon. And it's a mix of vineyards that are like alluvial, gravel, sand, stuff like that um, from like old dried out riverbeds. And then also vineyards <clears throat> that are on hillsides with clay over like limestone. Um, and in particular in the Loire, like some of the most in, in, let me back up in particular in Chinon and Bourgogne here in Touraine, some of the most, I don't know, exciting, like vineyards that produce the most powerful concentrated wines are vineyards, uh, on hillsides where like some of the, the limestone subsoil, this like layer of limestone tooth is closer to the surface because the river has carried away a lot of the clay there. So there's like a little bit of clay over it, but there's places on the hillsides where the limestone is closer to the surface. So there's maybe like a meter of clay or something like that. And then below that, the roots of the vines just get into this porous tooth limestone and that both holds moisture for the vines, but also it's very cold and it slows down the vines like process of ripening and um, allows the winemakers to harvest later and build up more concentration and power in the grapes. Um, Bernard Baudry is a domain that was created by the, the eponymously named Bernard Baudry created by Bernard Baudry back in uh, the 80s. Um, where's a picture of Bernard? There's, there's Bernard. So there's Bernard Baudry. There he is again. That's his son, Matthew, Matthew Baudry. And I'm going to go back to, actually, I want to go to this. Um, so yeah. So um, Bernard Badri inherited a few hectares of vines uh, back in the 80s, and he went to university and studied winemaking in Burgundy, um, you know, came back, started this domain, and he got really interested in terroir because, because Chinon has these very different uh, terroirs. Like there are places up on the plateau above the river where it's just like all clay, but the roots don't get into the limestone. Um, and then there's all these different soil types and exposures on the hillsides. And then down closer to the river, you have more fertile soil and stuff. Um, so he got really interested in that. And he was bringing a very like 
Burgundian idea of like single vineyards and expression of terroir. Um, and also like, I feel like Burgundian, like, like red Burgundy uh, is like often an elegant, like complex, you know, like, like can be very aromatic, very like pretty wines. He, in, in my impression or my experience, he sort of brought that approach to Chinon and a lot of their wines, there's something about them that tastes Burgundian. There's something like, like complex and sort of beautiful about the wines. Um, anyway, so he got really into like the expressions of different terroirs. And so then his son started working with him. Here are various vineyards. There's Mathieu in one of the vineyards. So Matthew started working with his father and they started buying up more like, like searching for different interesting, like little vineyards in, in interesting terroirs around Chinon. And at this point they have like 32 hectares. So they have relatively like a, a fair amount of land now that they have built up. Um, and they make a whole bunch of different cuvées. Uh, 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 uh. There's one hillside. Actually, there's some interesting. Uh, oh, there's some of the limestone subsoil, some of the tooth. Uh, this was this is just an interesting like photograph. This is looking down the hillside, and you can see like up here at the top, there's way more rocks because the soil has washed away. And then you get down like to the bottom of the hillside, and there's a lot less like there's less exposed rocks down there. There's a lot more or like clay and organic matter and stuff down there um, because it's been washed down from the top of the hill. Um, yeah, so here's like the top and then here's the bottom of the hill with a mix of like clay and sand. Uh, uh, uh. And they were like, they, you know, like each different part of the hillside brings different, like does different things to the grapes and brings different flavors um to the wine there's their cob barrels underground this so um i actually went and visited them back in 2012 when i went to the loire to visit uh laurent bonnois and we went and visited them and it was just a really mind-blowing fantastic experience because it was me and laurent and we drove over there in Laurent's like falling apart, like little Peugeot hatchback, you know, from like the early nineties or something like that. And Bernard Baudry is pretty famous. Like they're one of the greatest producers in Chinon, like people come from all over the world. So we pull into the little, you know, like uh, courtyard, little parking gravel parking area in front of their winery. And there was like, a big black Chevy Suburban and some like black, you know, BMW, like seven series sedan, like just leaving. There were a bunch of guys in suits and they were like, you know, wine importers from like New York or something like that. And you could just tell that like, you know, Bernard and Matthew were like, well, you know, like whatever, like it was, it was fine, but they were like these guys in suits and like their BMW, like seven series. And then like me and Laurent show up in this like beat up old Peugeot hatchback, you know, and, and like they know each other and stuff. And it was just like, like me and Laurent were like local people just showing up and they're like, Oh, come on in. Oh, here's this. Oh, it's, uh, how's that going? How are you doing? Like, tell me a story about that and stuff like that. And it was just a really, really cool experience of like, meeting them and talking to them in a very, very just like completely open, fun, personable way. And they had this display in their tasting room of, you know, their different, the different wines that they make and they reconstructed the subsoils of all these different vineyards. They dug down and like brought soil back so that they could have a display of the difference between all of the places. So what we're drinking right now, the Le Domaine, is this Chinon over here all the way on the right hand side and you see it comes from two different vineyard sites um and so i want to say this is the one with like clay and then like limestone down there and then this is the uh the vineyard site that's more like down by the river that's more alluvial like richer soil and sandy and stuff like that 
um, and they blend the two together to make this like a more uh, just like a balanced good expression of Chinon. And then you have all these other vineyard sites that I think is their youngest vines. They have a, they have a wine that's like young vines planted on like more sandy alluvial soil. And then, um, and then these are a bunch of their others. That's their one white wine, their Chenin Blanc, which is from um, uh, vines planted up on top of a ridge where there's like more rock at the surface and stuff. Um, also, I had a really good argument with them about what terroir is, whether culture and the winemaker is a part of terroir. And they were sort of like, no, terroir is really just like the soil, like the exposure and the weather. And I was like, but you have to have people. And I think that like culture and like the winemaker's experience comes into terroir and stuff. And it, I just bring it up because like, it was an interesting conversation because they had clearly thought a lot about it and had really strong ideas, you know, and like, I appreciated that. It wasn't like they were annoyed at having the conversation. It was more like having the conversation and they, they were really interested and engaged and had thought, obviously it was something that mattered a lot to them and that they had thought a lot about. So this is a hundred percent Cabernet Franc. Ah, it smells a tiny bit like floral. It smells a tiny bit like almost like lilacs. I get plenty of red fruit, plenty of like red, red raspberry. A little tiny bit of like, I was going to say bell pepper, but it's to, to me, it's more kind of sort of like tomato leaf or like spicy, spicy, like Thai basil or something like that. Like it's peppery and spicy, but it's not green smelling at all. Like, like bell pepper is. And it just has a little bit of that. It's just so well balanced. The tannin, the fruit offset each other perfectly. The tannin is like just right, lingers and then fades away. It's supple. It's elegant. I mean, tell me that this is not like that this doesn't remind you of like good, elegant, like really well-made, pretty red burgundy. Um, it really does for me. I really like this. Mm. Yeah, I totally, you know, doing these seminars, sometimes I kind of have to use like whatever wines, I have to, have to use like what wines I can get my hands on. But even given my choice of like every <clears throat> Chinon in the world, I would still probably choose this as a really fantastic expression of like what Chinon is and what Chinon can do and like also how Chinon compares to Bourgogne. which is the next wine. Uh, cool, yes. Bye, Matt. Uh, so Domaine de Bel Air Bourgogne, also 100% Cabernet Franc. And where did I just put that bottle? Uh, is that also 2018? Yeah. Okay. So these two, right. These are, these two are the same vintage. So the Bel Air Bourgoy and the Baudry Chinon are both 2018. Bourgoy reputationally is a little, little tiny bit, I think more muscular, a little, little tiny bit like more solid and substantial, a little bit less pretty than Chinon is. Um, let me go back to maps here. 
Uh, let's see. So sending hello to Burgoy, Burgoy, Chinon, right over here. Um, here is. Here we go. So, so Borgoy, so Restine, Bene. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> these vineyards are right around over in here. Um, some of, uh, uh, Pierre, Pierre Gautier, some of Pierre's vineyards are actually right in the center of Bene. He bought this little tiny, um, little tiny walled vineyard called um, Clos Nouveau, right in Benet. So these vineyards are right over here, like up above the Loire. So like down here, you know, you have more like fertile, like alluvial soil. And then these, you can see like, these are the hillsides here where like the land starts coming up and things start getting really, really interesting. And... Here are pictures of Pierre. So Pierre's a fifth generation winemaker. He's very, very French. He's a very, he is, he's like a quintessential French farmer. He is full of energy and loves life and loves farming and driving around on a tractor. And he's just a super nice guy. Um, that's a very good Loire picture. This past week, it's been all damp and rainy here. And I've been thinking about how very Loire like the climate has been over the past week, the damp, rainy weather that we've that we have had. Um, that's his new little vineyard, Clos Nouveau, that he had just planted when I uh, when I visited him uh, almost ten years ago. Uh, he ages the wines. He his wine his winemaking actually primarily happens. He has like a pavilion. It's like he's got a roof that's open on the sides. It's just like a big con huge concrete slab and like posts, you know, like con like steel girders and then a roof, but like no real walls, just so it's easy to like drive a forklift around and stuff and move tanks around and things like he's got that. He does a lot of his winemaking there. Um, but then all of the aging of the wine happens in underground cellars that I think were originally cut out as qu quarries. There we go. Uh, for quarrying limestone tooth, but that's that's what their cellars look like. Um, so this is 100% um, Cabernet Franc, um, farmed organically, hand harvested, fermented with native yeast, and it is aged in big old 600 liter uh, old oak casks. And so with the um, the Bernard, Bernard Baudry, where that was like some of the fruit in that came from like gravelly alluvial sandy soil. This is all clay over limestone. So this is like, these vineyards are probably harvested later. This smells darker, smells more woodsy. A little bit like baking chocolate. A little bit like blueberry, a little bit like pepper. Ah. That's delicious, but it's a little bit more tannic. Like it's a little bit more structured. It's a little, little tighter, a little stiffer where the Bernard Boundary was just like, I opened that and that was just gorgeous. This is great, but I want to taste this in like two or three years. Like it's, it is delicious now. I don't want to take away from that, but the Bel Air Bourgoy is definitely going to like, I think get better and come together where the Bernard Boundary is like just awesome and perfect right now. Yes. Also, yeah. Like the fact that like no one really knows who he is and um, that it's brought in by Laurent and Laurent just doesn't spend money on anything and has very low markups. This is just a ridiculously affordable um, 
poor boy. Man, the like the density that it has, the density and the concentration, but that's like offset by this acidity that's like that's uplifting at the front of the wine. And then there's also there's a little bit of like a tart like pithiness like that comes in after the tannin like at the very back of the finish. Wow. Gosh. I don't know why that guy is not more famous. Or why these wines aren't more famous. Because those are so good. Okay. Not to belabor that point, though. Um, moving on to my last wine. So this is Domaine Dino Show. Le Cote. This is Malbec. This is 100% Malbec from a tiny little vineyard up uh i believe on the share up above the loire or up above the share um this is in Touraine. i'm gonna go back to screen share and see if i can figure out where this actually is looking at the maps here uh let's see so this is terrain Uh, where is there's the Sarth? Okay, so the share. Okay, so it's somewhere. It's somewhere over in this neighborhood over here is where this this wine comes from. Um, Domaine Dino Show. It's a family winery. Um, it's run by Laurence and her brother Fabienne. They inherited the vineyards when their father passed away. Um, I don't know how much they were actually making wine before that. I don't think that Laurence really knew about like how to make wine when they inherited the vineyards, but I'm not sure really if their father even was making wine. I think he may have been like growing grapes and primarily selling them off. But so she and her brother inherited the vineyard and uh, <clears throat> decided that they wanted to keep it and had to sort of like figure out what to do. Um, and I, I just, I remember hearing, you know, about it from Laurent, like, cause they, he met them or he knew them or he met them and got to be friends with them. And he was sort of like helping them out, like actually like working in the vineyards and like helping them out, I think a little bit like making wine and stuff. Um, they primarily, originally their vineyards, primarily they had a lot of Pinot Donis planted and they still have those vineyards. And they make a Pinot, a red Pinot Donis. They make a Pinot Donis Rosé. Um, I think that's most of what I've seen. And then I think at some point in the past couple of years, they acquired this little like one acre plot of Malbec on a hillside that was just like a really fantastic like little spot. Um, and this is, this is actually to me for like Malbec is a traditional grape in the Loire Valley and it's grown like all around Touraine and also down in Anjou. Um, but I, I've had plenty that were not particularly ripe. I've had a bunch that were like, like Malbec, fully ripening Malbec in the Loire Valley is always a little bit of a gamble. It feels like, um, this one every year that i've had it, it it's a like pretty dense pretty ripe developed malbec it seems like this particular vineyard site is really good for ripening malbec it actually smells kind of floral to me i expected it to be fruitier it smells a little bit like blueberry Maybe a little bit like, no, not really strawberry. But it smells like fresh fruit. It smells like bright, like juicy, fresh fruit. Sort of a, like fresh black raspberry.
It has maybe about as much tannin as the Bourgoy. Maybe a tiny, I mean, about the same, maybe a tiny bit less, but it's sort of, it has like more like giving sort of unctuous fruit to it. Yeah, maybe more tannin actually now on that second mouthful of the wine, you know, but this, yeah, this is classic Loire Malbec. It's dark. It has substantial tannins. It has good acidity. Um, this in particular though is riper than, um, you know, it's it's a little unusually ripe, or it's it's per, it's a particularly good Loire Malbec or a Loire Cope. Um, there's nothing like unripe about this. The tannins are are the tannins are ripe. They're not green at all, and it has the fruit to like to carry the tannin and acidic structure that this has. Where sometimes you run into Malbec from the Loire, and they don't have the fruit to support the tannic and acidic structure that they have or the tannins like the wines weren't completely ripe and so the tannins are a tiny bit green a tiny bit like under ripe uh i forget at some point i knew how much they made of this i forget now laurent told me like three or four years ago in passing um but i want to say it's like four or five hundred cases of it it's for another it's another pretty small production wine Mm. Yeah. Um, all of those, I feel like all of those, yeah, all of those red wines, like they all had a freshness and like a, a bright acidity to them and a like a firm structure. Like they all had this like, like brightness, freshness, and this sort of like acidic and tannic structure that both like kept them organized tasting and also at the same time made them taste sort of like fresh and bright and clean. Um, all of them to me taste like red wines from a relatively like cooler environment where the grapes weren't getting like super ripe, soaking up a whole lot of sun, building up a ton of sugar and potential alcohol, you know, and like killing off the aromatics and like some of the more um, like, fine detail of the wines all of these reds today tasted like wines from a cool climate that are like you know a lot of these were like they were properly ripe but they have like a brightness and freshness and like good acidity and tannin and everything so you know that's that's like the one that's that's the commonality that i feel like i can pick out you know despite the loire being such a huge place with you know a lot of different styles of wine and a lot of different AOCs and different winemakers and everything like that's sort of the commonality. Um, and that is, I think both due to the climate and also to the, you know, to the winemakers and the culture there. Um, also, you know, I think, I mean, I was trying to obviously pick out good wines for this and not pick out bad wines to taste, but all of these were like ripe, good, like rich red wines. None of none of these were underripe. None of these were like lean or underripe or like driven by green tannins or something like that. And um, you know, I think that is just important to point out that the Loire used to have a harder time ripening red grapes, or like there was more of a reputation for red wines that were like a little underripe and lean and stuff like that and STEMI and like none of these suffered from that. Like the Loire is definitely getting better at making red wines. And I think we're going to see, we're just going to see more of that. We're going to see more interesting red wines coming out of the Loire. Um, those are sort of the two, the two conclusions, I guess I can pull from, from tasting through these six wines. So uh, I hope you all had fun. Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching and listening and tasting wine with me. Um, next week I'm going to do Portugal. I'm going to finally do my, uh, my, my long awaited Portuguese seminar. I've got enough Portuguese wines kicking around on hand that, um, 
I've got plenty of cool, exciting things from around Portugal to, to choose from. So uh, I'll see you next week when uh, we go back down to the, um, uh, what is that? Um, not Andalusia. When we go back down to the whatever Spanish peninsula down there. Thanks a lot. Have a great afternoon. Have a good Thursday. Bye, everybody.